What's up, sports history fan? Dana Augusta here of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. Ever wish you can get behind the scenes access to the Hockey Hall of Fame and dive into the untold stories that shaped the game? Then you need to check out Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories Part 2 by Eric Zwieg. Eric's latest book is packed with wild, unexpected tales from epic rivalries and game-changing moments to quirky incidents like polo injuries and snowblower mishaps. Eric Zwieg's impeccable research and passion for the sport of hockey will whisk you through the NHL's early years, the origins of the Three Stars tradition, and how hockey first hit the airwaves. Plus, you get fresh takes on legends like Wayne Gretzky, Bobby Hall, and Joe Sackick. Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 is available now wherever you get your books. Grab your copy and get ready to dive deep into the heart of the game. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I'm your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We're bringing old-school basketball to a new school audience. And today we bring you the story of when Michael Jordan lost in a game of one-on-one, and it was not even to another NBA player. He lost to a business executive. So let me set the scene for you. It is the summer of 2003 and Michael Jordan had just retired from the NBA for the third and final time. He was 40 years old, which is ancient by NBA standards, but he had just wrapped up an all-star season. So at the age of 40, he was still averaging 20 points per game. And that is not an easy thing to do, especially once you hit 40. So, if a 40-year-old Michael Jordan were ever to be matched up with a player who had never even played in the NBA in a game of one-on-one, I would bet every dollar that I had on Michael Jordan. And I would have lost it all, just as Michael Jordan lost this particular matchup. So, why was Jordan even playing this game of one-on-one? Well, every summer, Jordan had run his annual summer camp for rich guys. It was called Michael Jordan's Senior Flight School, and every camper paid $15,000 to participate in the camp. And this was only a three-day camp. So these guys were paying $5,000 a day, plus their own travel and expenses to Las Vegas, where the camp was held. So back in 2003, it was probably a $20,000 trip minimum for each of the participants. With inflation, that's about $32,000 in 2024 money. Now, just for three days of basketball drills and scrimmages, and it was not like the campers were even receiving formal instruction from Jordan. They were receiving instruction from a collection of NBA assistant coaches and some college coaches. They would go through some warm-ups and drills to get each day started, and then they would spend most of the day in scrimmages against each other. Now, of course, Michael Jordan was around. After all, the only reason any of these guys would spend that kind of money on a basketball camp was for a chance to meet the legend himself. He would hang around near the end of each session and shake hands with everyone, sign a few autographs, and maybe drop a pearl of wisdom regarding how to bump a defender to create shooting space. And now, the really big draw of the camp was that Jordan would take over one of the training sessions and offer to play one-on-one against any camper who was willing to take the challenge. The rules of the game were very simple. If you make the shot, you keep possession of the ball. This is also known as make it, take it. Each shot counted for just one point and the game ended when the first player reached three points. So there was very little margin for error. Remember, it was make it, take it. If Jordan scored first, he kept possession and could easily make a second and third shot and the game was over before the camper even broke a sweat. So to be fair, the camper always started the game with possession of the ball just to give the camper a fighting chance. In a typical session, Jordan would play anywhere from 20 to 25 straight games of one-on-one as each camper was quickly dispatched by the dead a score who ever lived. Jordan typically destroyed each camper within a minute or two, and then the next victim stepped onto the court for his turn. In all of the years that Jordan ran that camp, he had never lost a game of one-on-one. I mean, just think about it. He was still an active NBA player, and the campers were all over 40 years old, and none of them had ever even played in the NBA. A few of them had played Division I college basketball. Others had played some high school ball. Others simply played regular pickup at the YMCA. 
but they were all financially successful, successful enough to drop $20,000 for a three-day weekend in Las Vegas to meet Michael Jordan. So in that summer of 2003, it was the day that Michael Jordan ran the one-on-one -on -one session, and taking the stage as the opponent for the game at the heart of our story is one John Rogers. On the day of the game, Rogers was a 45-year-old CEO and founder of Ariel Investments located in Chicago. Rogers was only six feet tall, which meant that he was six inches shorter than Michael Jordan. He was the same height as Allen Iverson, but much, much slower. On paper, there was no match between the great Michael Jordan, who was still in NBA shape. Now, this was not the first time that Rogers had met Michael Jordan. When Jordan was considering returning to the NBA in 2001, he organized some pickup games to help himself get into basketball shape. And these runs were happening during the NBA season, so he could not ask NBA players to help out. He put together some players who had some college basketball experience to help Jordan break a sweat and get some shots up. And Rogers had played in a hand full of those pickup games in Chicago to help Jordan prepare to return to the NBA as a member of the Washington Wizards. But now it was time to play for real. With all of the campers watching, Roger stepped onto the court as the last challenger of the day. And this is a good place to take a break. And I'll be right back with how the game turned out. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, this is Ross Bliley from the podcast Pigskin Tales. This podcast is sponsored by Sterling Soap Company. With products sold throughout 41 locations around the globe, Sterling Soap Company has a unique assortment of products to choose from for your loved one for the holidays. Handmade artisan soaps created by Roderick and Amanda Lovin since 2012, these products are affordable and provide great value. Act now and save on your shipping costs. If you purchase $75 or more, your shipping cost is free in the United States. Shop now online at sterlingsoap.com. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of the time that Michael Jordan lost a game of one-on-one -on -one to an investment executive who was 45 years old at the time. Now, as I mentioned before the break, Michael Jordan had just wrapped up his playing career in the summer of 2003 with the Washington Wizards and he was running his senior flight school camp where the wealthy could pay an exorbitant amount of money to hang out in Las Vegas for three days and play some pickup basketball while Michael Jordan watched. The opponent for this game, John Rogers, was no slouch at basketball. He had played college basketball at Princeton University where he averaged 3.5 points in just 23 games at the college level. So John Rogers stepped onto the court for this game of one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan. And as I mentioned earlier, Jordan always let the camper have the first possession. Jordan checked the ball to Rogers and then Jordan got down into a defensive stance. Now Rogers' strategy was to show no fear and no hesitation. Upon receiving the ball, he quickly drove to his right and made a wild layup that went in. Some would say it was a lucky shot. Some would say that he simply caught Jordan off guard by taking off so quickly upon receiving the ball. Michael was still in the middle of saying, what, y'all think I had this camp just so y'all could beat me? 
He had not even finished his sentence when Rodgers took off for that first basket. Rodgers very expertly used his left arm to keep Jordan at a distance while he shot the ball with his right hand. So under the rules of the game, Rodgers kept possession of the ball. At this point, Rodgers already has the crowd of campers behind him as he was one of the only campers to even score a single point against Jordan. For his second effort with the ball, Rodgers hesitated and then drove to his left. It is essentially the same move as the first time except going from the left side with his left hand. Jordan tried to block the shot, but Rodgers went really wide with his left hand and kind of hooked it off the glass. Well now, Rodgers was up 2-0. to zero. Jordan had not even had the ball yet, so now the rest of the campers are getting really excited. But now Jordan was not talking anymore. There was no way that Jordan could live with himself if he lost a game of one-on-one -on -one to a 45-year-old man who barely played college basketball. Jordan was now locked in. He was staring at Rodgers like Rodgers was a young Kobe Bryant trying to ascend Jordan's throne. So, for his third possession, Rodgers goes back to his right for a driving layup. Jordan moves his feet like it was a playoff game and forced Rodgers to drive a little too wide to the right to have any real chance of a layup. And that worked for Jordan. Rodgers missed the shot, which meant that possession now went to Jordan. At this point, everyone in the gym assumed that Jordan was simply going to drive three straight times, pass the slower Rodgers, and make three easy layups to win the game. Or perhaps make a short fallaway jump shot. Now, as Jordan took the ball, he started trash talking again because now he was in full control of the game with the ball in his hands. He even stopped to make fun of the fact that Rodgers was wearing Adidas shoes when nearly everyone else at the camp showed up wearing the latest Air Jordans. I mean, after all, it was the Jordan camp. Who would dare wear Adidas to the Jordan camp? Well, anyway, after taking a jab step, Jordan rose up and took an uncontested jump shot from the top of the key and drained it, but Rodgers was still up two to one. Now, Jordan got to keep the ball since he made his shot and he easily took a second shot from the top of the key and he drained that one too. And with that, the game was tied. Jordan took his trash talking to even another level where now he was simply toying with Rodgers. Jordan kept giving him jab steps to force Rodgers to step back in anticipation of a lightning fast drive. Jordan took his third shot, which should have ended the game. It was another uncontested jump shot from the top of the key, but this one bounced off the front of the rim. The game was now getting tense. Possession of the ball returned to Rodgers. In a game of cat and mouse, Jordan actually steps back from Rodgers and lets Rodgers have an open jump shot from the top of the key. He did not want Rodgers to drive to the basket, so Rodgers took the bait and shot a long distance jump shot and missed. Rodgers raced to the baseline to get his own rebound thinking he'd be able to keep possession. But in the rules of big boy one-on-one, -on -one, the kind that they play between NBA players, a missed shot was an automatic turnover. The other player gets possession without having to rebound the ball. So possession went back to Jordan, even though Rodgers had chased down the rebound. Rodgers sets up in the middle of the lane because he does not want to let Jordan drive to the basket. He let Jordan have the outside shot and Jordan took it and missed again. This time, the ball bounced off the right side of the rim. Now, this is like a 12 round boxing match. Between the two players, they had now missed three straight shots, each of which could have ended the game. Jordan continued to trash talk, but this time he set up his feet closely to Rodgers. I mean, why not? Jordan was quick enough to jump up and easily block the jump shot and yet still quick enough to stay in front of Rodgers if Rodgers decided to drive to the basket. Jordan had Rodgers exactly where he wanted him. So, Rodgers drove to his left again. He used his right hand to push Jordan under the basket and then leans to his left to make a left-handed layup. And you can even hear Jordan say, oh no, a game over. Rodgers defeats Jordan. Everyone clapped for Rodgers because he had just done the impossible. He beat Michael Jordan in a one-on-one -on -one game. Now, this is the point where one of the other campers got really loud and asked Jordan how it felt to get humiliated. Jordan tried to play it off, but the guy would not let up. This other loud camper was comedian and actor Damon Wayans, who paid his $15,000 just like everyone else, and he really started to give Jordan a hard time and said that he should take Jordan's picture off the wall and replace it with a picture of Rogers. And to the credit of John Rogers, and I love this part by the way, 
he made hundreds of DVD copies of the game and he handed them out to everybody like they were business cards. And I have to be honest, I would have done the same thing. I would have taken a freeze frame of the winning shot, put it in a picture frame and hung it over the mantle of my house. For the rest of his life, John Rogers has a story that he can tell at dinner parties that nobody would be able to top. As for Jordan, he never again played one-on-one -on -one against his campers. He limited his interactions to shaking hands, taking pictures, and signing autographs. He was never going to get beat like that ever again, and I don't blame him. Well, <laughs> that is it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of another team from the old ABA. This time, we will discuss the Oakland Oaks, who eventually became the Virginia Squires. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesterday year. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.